Hello and welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell. My name's James Miley, and today we have uh, a, a great panel of uh, gentlemen who've been around the markets for 99 years. We've put together cumulative investing experience. Anton Tagliaferro, John Abernethy, and Jeff Wilson. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, James. Let's get straight into it. We're gonna get a big picture view on the investing environment today and try and put it in the context of a, a three to five year view for, uh, for our listeners out there. Anton, I'm going to start it with you because it's been uh, a topic that everyone's interested in. A few weeks ago, you addressed uh, a letter to the new RBA governor uh, pleading him uh, to stop the cutting of Australian interest rates and not to debase the currency. Why was this such an important issue for you to raise? <clears throat> well, look, I think central banks around the world, in, in our opinion, seem to have lost the plot a little bit. And uh, I think, as you said in our letter, they seem to be encouraging people, they want people to borrow heavily and they're sort of effectively penalising borrowers. You know, So many people have saved money all their lives who are hoping to use that money to earn some interest and, and, and live on that income. Effectively, many countries around the world, that hasn't happened yet in Australia, and hopefully it never will, you know, many countries around the world, there's neg there are negative interest rates. So people actually lose money by having money in the bank. Yet on the other hand, if, you, if you're borrowing heavily, you're sort of incentivised and in effectively given a, an okay pat on the back, which in our view is absolute madness. You know, that's not, uh, you know, that's not what central banks should be doing. You know, that's not prudent uh, fisc financial monetary management in our view. On the back of that, John, let's talk about distortions. I know you have a, a, a big macro view and a, and a, and a top-down you know, opinion of things. Where are we seeing distortions as a result of some of these these, these things that Anton talking Well, clearly in, in bond markets, there's distortions. There's obviously distortions in currency markets, and that's what central banks are trying to mani manipulate. Um, uh, and then it leads to equities, because equity, you get PE expansion, uh, where PEs are much higher than the potential for growth, you know, which makes it very hard to buy. So distortion of bond market leading to distortion in all, mar all asset markets. And the longer it goes on, the greater the distortion and the, the greater the risk of a, a, a quite a major correction. Okay. Um, we see the market continually fixated with the direction that interest rates are going to take. Is this the one thing that's going to, to, to pull down the house of cards? Anton, I'll send, I'll send that one your way. Look, yeah, would, 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 would rising interest rates necessarily, is, is that the one thing that's going to, is that the one thing we have to watch? Yeah, look, if, if, if inflation went up, which led central banks to, to, to put their short rates up, it would be quite disastrous. But I, I, I don't think short rates are going to go up in a hurry because when you look around the world, you know, in Australia, growth is quite feeble and people are overgeared anyway. Uh, same in, in the EU and, and Japan, it's hard to see rates go up because the economies there are, are you know, pretty poor. In the US, we're talking about a small rate rise of a quarter of a percent. Even then, the, the Fed's hesitating and getting sort of jelly, jelly legs every time there because growth is quite feeble. So, so it's more a correction in the bond markets, I think. This is what we're talking about. And I think there's no, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that bond markets have got to ridiculous levels. And there's, a, there's only one reason, clear reason in my mind, where they're at that level is because central banks have manipulated this the bond rate. You know, they keep doing this effectively a, an, an ongoing share buyback. They keep buying back bonds. Hedge funds keep uh, buying ahead of the central banks. And then poor old institutions like life companies and banks, which have to hold bonds, are kind of last in the queue. So that's the nonsense going on in bond deals. But I think the fact is nobody, I don't think many equity investors actually believe those bond deals. In fact, while pricing has been impacted a little bit by the lower bond deals, I don't think, I think so anybody's taking the, yeah. you know, even Japan, zero rates, you know, you haven't got PEs at 100. But no. So nobody's really taking those bond deals too seriously, I don't think. Jeff, Jeff I'm going to um, bring in a topic that you often talk about, which is the duration of bull markets. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, we're well overdue. We're well overdue, seven, <laughs> yeah. seven or yeah. years. Yes. Um, yes. Bring well up overdue a, for a correction. For a correction. Bring up yeah. a chart we can see that I've put together which shows the, um, the S&P 500, which is yes. um, head and shoulders above what we've done here yeah. in Australia. Yeah. Have the, do you think that the, the relatively higher interest rates in Australia have, have held back the performance of our market at all? Oh, not overly. I mean, one of the tough things, as, as we've all been talking about, is the phenomenal amount of liquidity that's been pumped into the system. And the, um, I mean, the terrible thing is everyone says, oh, it's different this time. Uh, it, it, it's been a longer bull market and it will end, unfortunately, in pain at some point in time. Yeah, we just don't know when uh, and we don't know what the catalyst is going to do that. Uh, um, as, as you said before, like we've near, we're one year off 100 years of investing here and we've seen it before, you know, whether it was the 
you know, the uh, yeah, 82, um, whether it's the 87 crash. And, and when you look at uh, the 87 crash, you've got to remember for the year of 87, if you bought at the start of the year, at one stage, if you'd sold you know, the month before the crash in October, you're up 50% plus. And even, if you, even though the market fell, I think 48%, from you know, the 19th or 20th of October here till the end of the year, you only lost 6% over the year. So, I mean, the tough thing is when you're investing in the market, you need to keep playing the game <laughs> effectively. You've just got to be cautious because you know that there will be a significant adjustment at some point in time. We just can't tell you when that is. Okay, well, that's, I think that's a good point to, to move on. Let's talk about today's market. Let's talk about what people are investing against. Um, the other phenomenon we've seen domestically is that um, of late, small caps have been where a lot of performance has been generated ahead of the, the top 20 companies in Australia in particular, where there's been some struggles. If, if we cast our eyes forward, uh, Jeff, I'll stay with you. Small versus large cap, whereabouts are you thinking about or where do you want to be thinking about going for your returns? The, I mean, the interesting thing is, in terms of looking for growth, yeah, it, it, that's where it is at the moment in the mids and smalls. Um, the tough thing is, as we've, you know, as we've talked about before, you know, with the very low interest rates, valuations are high, so you're actually paying up for that growth. Um, and at the big end of the market, you know, everyone's sort of running away from it. <laughs> you know, but that, you know, I mean, if you're a counter-cyclical investor, <laughs> you, know, you may, taking a medium-term view, you know, want to have a reasonable weighting up there as well. So uh, yeah, I, I suppose that's a, a little bit each way. Yeah, short term, I think still think the momentum in the mids and smalls, but yeah, you know, don't don't ignore you know, the other large caps. There's some very good companies there. I'm going to take the same question over here, John. What, what's your assessment? What's happening in the sort of the top 20 or the top 50 space of the Australian market? There's no the bull market in the top 20, and that's the problem. There's a bull market in the middle market, but there's no bull market in the top market in the, the top end of the market. You know, the Australian index, which is driven by the top part of the market, is still you know. 1,200 points below its peak in 2007. So it's a funny bull market if that's what it is because we're not reaching new peaks. Mm. We're unlikely to reach a new peak in this decade. <coughs> and this is the longest sustained period where a market hasn't made a new peak. So we're in record breaking territory. <laughs> but the small cap market clearly has made new peaks. So it's a two tiered market. Jeff's, Jeff's probably right. You know, if you're thinking counter cyclical and going against the trend, you'd probably be looking at the top end for a bit of value. But the problem at the top end is there's massive problems with margin compression and telcos, retailers, banks, you know, resources are in oversupply situation. And it's not a very attractive place to invest unless you're prepared to take a very low return dominated by yield. And that's the top end of the market. Anton, I'm gonna hand over to you, but we're gonna talk about how we're gonna get our returns in this current environment. Um, I know you like to think about things, a combination of some, some capital growth and yield. Can you talk us through, you know, how you're thinking about getting your total return out of those two components and, and where you're seeing some opportunities in the market? Yeah, the look, market. again, I, I, don't, I, I don't like talking sort of sectors or top 20, X20, you know, small cap. I, I just think it's, it's, it's the sort of environment where you've got to be very selective, you know. There's still opportunities. There's sometimes opportunities in the top 20 and there are sometimes opportunities outside that. And, uh, and oh, you know, while, uh, you know, some people like Jeff talk about a crash, I'm not so bearish because generally... Before you get a, a crash, you, you normally get a lot of nonsense, you know, you get a lot of uh, speculation and, uh, and, you know, so pre the GFC we had the, the Babcock and Browns and all that nonsense going on, you know, with, with the Macquarie vehicles and, and all that gearing, whatever. We're not, we're not seeing huge gearing this time, you know. Pre the 87 stock market crash, we had all the gold stocks and the speckies going mad. Well, we've got a little bit of that now, but not, not to, to a great extent. So I think well, it's a funny bull market because, as John said, it's not really a rampant, everything going crazy market. And that's normally when you get a big correction. So now I can't talk about the US where obviously the Nasdaq's gone crazy, but certainly in Australia, you don't get that feeling that caution to the wind, that effervescence. So I think we will see volatility as we're seeing now. Uh, but I think one's got to be opportunistic, you know. So uh, in the top 20, as we said, the banks have got issues, the uh, supermarket retailers have got issues, um, the resource stocks have got issues. But for example, now a stock that's come off is Transurban, you know, which has come off very quickly. Uh, sure, maybe at $12 it was a bit silly, but at $10.50 now come a 25 cent dividend in December, it's probably looking, you know, time to be having a closer look. So there's one there. So uh, again, I'm just going to hold you on the point about... Um 
growth in yield. Do you, do you think, are you relying more on yield to get well, your returns? Well, yield obviously moment? is always the nice bit that's your certainty of return. So if you can buy a transurban today on a yield of five, that's a bit of, that's the return you're going to get for the next 12 months. Nobody can predict where the share price is going to go, but you know that at least you're going to get that income. Uh, so it's a, it's a combination of both, right? Uh, another one, Spark Infrastructure, you know, which is now corrected uh, down to a yield of 7%. You know, and it's given you distribution guidance after 2021. So, I, you know, you look at that on a 7% yield, you go, well, you know, I don't think growth's going to take off, you know, so that doesn't look too bad. So 7% plus growth, right? So, John, I'm going to take it over to you. Traditional sources of yield, people think about stocks like Telstra, uh, the big banks, some of the, um, you know, the, the grocery department stores, et cetera, et cetera. How are you thinking about those stocks and, 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 and getting yield from the market, particularly well, for a lot of investors that will have large ex exposures to those well, sorts I'd of be thinking that I'd be thinking this, they're not going to stop paying dividends. That's the good news, because we're not going into recession. Uh, they're going to struggle to grow dividends for a few years, uh, and some of them might have declining dividends in the, in the short term. So they're still healthy yields. Uh, I think the market, uh, may surprise some people when, when we have seen it with ANZ Bank, uh, which we may talk about later, but you know, when it cut dividend, its share prices rallied. And I think there's, uh, in, the share market's fairly mature, fairly sensible, and when it can see that a new level of dividends is being set, which can grow, it can grow from, the market will reward that. It certainly won't reward uncertainty, and I think a lot of public companies like trading in uncertainty with their dividends. Okay. Jeff, I'm going to come over to you. Um, talking about, you know, um, dividend and a three to five year view. Um, whereabouts are you thinking about, you know, doing your shopping? And can you maybe give us a few examples of the kind of stocks that you like in this environment? Yeah. For now, is that grocery shopping or? <laughs> you can tell us where you like your grocery <laughs> no, shopping. No, sorry. I just, because I know, because John was talking about the retailers and yep. I thought Woolworths could be topical. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. The, the in terms of, you know, we think, the best opportunities in the mids and smalls um, for us, uh, and and one we like there um, is Ardent Leisure. You know, you know, four and a bit percent yield. You know, the business as they are rationalising their portfolio businesses, it'll be a pure main event play, which is a US uh, dollar play, and we think there's significant upside in that. So that's one. I mean, another stock that gives you a reasonable yield is you know, Climb. Yeah, if you look at the current valuations, yeah, you know, um, that's climate investment management. Uh, it's capitalised at about good management team. Well, you can ask John. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're a good management team. Yeah, they've got six hundred million of fund uh, capitalised. Yeah, you know, once you you look at the you know, the, the actual funds management business, probably about fifteen million of. Um, if, if you take the uh, the assets on the balance sheet away uh, against. You know, say Contango, which is a uh, you know just listed in the last few days, it's capitalised at seventy six million. And it's got six fifty million of farm. So either one's incredibly cheap, or the other one's looking a little expensive. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to wrap that discussion up there. I think the message is things are looking a little long in the tooth, but I don't think it's time to panic. We might be a little lucky here in Australia that our rates are quite significantly higher than the rest of the world and you need to be selective when you do your shopping. Give me my pen back. <laughs> <laughs>